Please welcome Larry Jordan and Norm Holland. Go ahead, guys. Take Michael gave us a challenge. He said, can you talk about documentaries for 45 minutes? I said, we could talk about documentaries for about 45 days. 35, <laughs> 35. Oh, Okay, so I'm going to sit down in the audience then. Shut up, Michael. The uh, Creating a captivating documentary starts with a plan, that's Norman's side, flows into questions, that's my side, which are then realized in a story, that's Norman's side. One of the most interesting challenges for me is I grew up directing live television. And for me, it was all technology all the time, because live is as much about technology as anything else. Norman grew up doing feature films, and for him, it's all about story. So when he and I first met, it was like this clash, because I felt technology was everything, and Norman really doesn't care about technology, and instead cares everything about story, and I can spell story. So it was a really nice it's perspective, perfect. Perfect. because both of us felt the other was worthless. I've done more than 4,000 interviews for radio, TV, local stations, networks, the web, podcast, and I may be understating by as many as 1,000. I've done lots. So the first part, which is, which is going to be a keynote presentation for about seven slides, is some initial thoughts that I've got on doing documentaries. Oh, and Norman, just to establish his credibility, has been interviewed about 4,000 times. So he has been... He has been in front of the cameras while I've been behind it. But that was a punchline, guys. You, this you, is the best it gets. This you, is you gotta, you gotta react to these things, or Larry gets really pissy. The first thing is the best attribute that an interviewer needs is curiosity. I'm always curious about who I'm talking to or what they do, and curiosity drives everything. If you're not curious, then why are you doing it in the first place? And it's not that you're trying to convey an opinion, it's that you're trying to help the audience understand what's cool about this subject. So if you're interested in the subject, if you're curious about the subject, then your subjects will be interesting in return. If you're phoning it in, they're gonna phone it in. So the level of energy that you pour into your questions is the level of energy you're gonna get out. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. The second best attribute is the ability to get your guests to relax. I don't care who your guest is, whether they're a pro or an amateur, everybody is afraid of being on camera. It's an intimidating experience. Even if they say, oh yeah, I've been on a million and a half times, they're still intimidated. Your goal is to help them get past that because if you can get them to relax on camera, you're gonna get much better answers. And there's a technique that I use that, that goes into this in a little bit of detail that I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Every documentary, before you start, needs a plan and a point of view. Every interview before you start needs a plan and a point of view. Every interview I've done, even though I've done thousands of them, every single interview I've ever done, and Michael will attest to this, I have a written script that I go into with questions to get me started for the interview. Now, I'll go off script. I'll ask questions that come up. But every single interview has, has written out questions beforehand because I need to know this is the direction I'm going. This is the information that I need before I even start. It's like having a map. If you don't know where you're going, how do you get there? And how do you know you've arrived when you have arrived? You can change your plan, even your point of view, but it's essential that you start from a known point. And stay focused. I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, I did this interview in an hour and a half. That says, producer who can't plan. That says someone who has no clue what they're going after. If you can't get the information you need in 30 minutes, you've run out of energy and your guest is exhausted. So focus on what's my goal. The top of every interview page where I've got the sheet of paper, the goal for this interview is X. It's always stated explicitly. Then the key questions that I need to get to get to X. Because you've, the, the more you focus and the more energy you pour into it, the better off you're going to be. So I want to talk a little bit about asking questions, and I will let Norman speak in just a second. He really is an incredible speaker, and once you start to hear him, you'll never listen to me again. He's a amazing, how am I doing, is that okay? Anyway. That's, that's you want an to intimidating setup. Shut Thank up. You. So the, uh, 
And this is his interviewing style. <laughs> you want to start with something easy. I generally ask someone their name, and most of the time they can remember. When they can't, this tells me that we need to go even slower because they really, really are terrified. It's an easy question. They know the answer. They say, hey, I can answer these questions. I can do this. I'm not going to die here. The next thing I ask them is what's their name, and what's their company they work for, and what's their title. Now, the title generally trips people up because for some reason people remember the company they work for and they can remember their name, but I've had vice presidents blank on what their title was. So this is sort of a harder question to get their brain in focus. Now we get into the important stuff. Never ask a question that can be answered with a yes or no. Norma, did you get up this morning? I sure did. Where do I go with that? <laughs> there's nothing I can do. There's, there's no follow-on. Did you get up yesterday morning? Yeah, I sure did. I mean, this has got to admit is one of the dumber interviews you've ever heard because we're asking yes or no questions. There's, there's nowhere we can go with this. So, Yes, you, that's true. <laughs> you want to ask questions that begin with who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, I've known this since the beginning of time, about the same time that I met Norman, and we can use terms like describe, tell, or explain, which are different ways of saying what. But I was doing a consulting gig earlier this year, and I was meeting with a team of editors who put short documentaries, three to five minute documentaries, non-news, but, but news focused together. And they said, help me understand what question solicits what emotion. And this caused me to think, and this is new. I haven't presented this before, and I'm curious to see what you think of it, so we'll talk about it afterward. There's actually hidden meanings in the question. When you ask a who, a what, or a when question, you're gathering facts. When did the flooding start? Who was there? What happened? This is gathering facts. The word how, how did this happen, establishes a process. The flooding began January last year we immediately began putting sandbags together. We start to talk about the process and why delivers the emotion. If that's a true description of each of these sets of words, then it tells me that we should begin the interview with what, who, and when questions which are factual, which get our people into that particular moment and get us thinking about the facts. And they start to relax and they start to get comfortable but we don't ask how, and we definitely don't ask why, because that exposes them too quickly, and they don't yet have a level of trust in you as an interviewer that you're not going to hang them out to dry. So when I'm doing my interviews, I'm now structuring my questions. Not only do I write the questions out, but I have a specific type of question at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And this is, this is what struck me as really interesting. This is the emotional arc of an interview. It's also the emotional arc of how you present an interview when you get it edited, and Norman's going to talk about this a lot. I start with a what question. There's nothing more dramatic than just before the explosion, the car skidded off the road. We have to find out what happened. Then we talk about when. We talk about who was involved. Well, the emotion falls because we're establishing facts. We're establishing the background. Then we start to build the emotion. We start to do how. How did the rescue occur? When did the, fill, when did the rope break? How many people were involved? We're starting to get into the process, and the emotion is building. And at the end, we pay it off with why. Why has to have an emotional answer. You have to have emotions to answer why. I felt this. I had to do that. And the emotion is the hook that gets people to watch. So I'm structuring my interviews with this arc. I hadn't realized it, that I've been doing it subconsciously for so many years, but this is exactly how I do an interview because I need to get them into the moment, I need to get them thinking about the facts, and then I get them to extrapolate upon the facts and then give me an emotional payoff, which means that when I'm listening to the interview, I'm listening for a strong what statement to start, that's my open, and I'm listening for a strong why statement to wrap it up. Why? I was never so relieved in my life 
when we got to the car after the explosion and everything inside it was safe. <sighs> Fade to black, we're done. This to me explains not only the types of questions but where they fit inside an interview. The other thing that I've done is I always ask the interview guest to repeat my question, but it's not for the reason that you think. Now, I haven't rehearsed this, and God knows Norman is not a normal interview guest. Oh my God, what are we doing? <clears throat> but I want to try and illustrate this. No trust yet. <laughs> Norman, before you became the august anointed and endowed chair at USC, which you so richly deserved to sit in, you were a feature film editor. And one of the films that you edited was, um, what had a hand in editing, was Sophie's Choice. I'm interested, what did you do with Sophie's Choice? I was a music editor on Sophie's Choice. Okay. Now, this time I want you to repeat my question so that I can hear my question as part of your answer. Okay. What does a music editor do? So a music editor basically helps every piece of music fulfill the story points that the director and the writer want. Now let's just, let's try and repeat my question as you, uh, as you give your answer, because uh, I want to make sure that, that uh, I can put it in the correct context. Well, why is, why is a music editor even necessary? I mean, can't the, the person that's doing the editing handle the music as well? A lot of people can actually handle the music editing. It doesn't always have to be a music editor, honestly. Um, but that task exists, whether there's a separate music editor, whether the picture editor is doing it, whether the sound editor is doing it. Now, Norman is a really good guest. He speaks English. You notice there's no ums, there's no ahs, there's no ers. I once did an interview, it ran 24 minutes. 24 minutes, I cut the ums out, it ran seven. So this time... I could do that for you. This time, I really, 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 really want you to include my question in your answer, okay? Now, I will do this until you do, because otherwise this example is going to fall apart. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay? I, I'll um, stop... Uh, fucking with you. Um. <laughs> er. I have grave doubts, that's true. <laughs> what was the biggest challenge in editing Sophie's Choice, the music? So the biggest challenge that I had when I edited Sophie's Choice, how am I doing so far? Yeah. The biggest challenge that I had in editing Sophie's Choice had to do with a particular piece of music that had been selected on set for Kevin Klein to perform to. Hold that thought for a second. I'm going to ask him again, and a slightly different question, but now I want you to listen to his answer, and he doesn't know what I'm setting him up for, but I want you to listen to his answer, and I want you to listen to the rhythm of his answer. It's the rhythm that I'm interested in. What made the music that you had with Kevin Klein so challenging? The music that had originally been selected for Kevin Klein was from a very, very popular record of Beethoven's Ninth, which when we finally went to go and get the rights to, was way more expensive than we could afford, even for a studio film. So we had to find a different recording of it, which we did, thank God for those Eastern European orchestras, but it was at a completely different set of tempo. <laughs> so I ended up having to, in 19, I think this was 1902 that I did this. Um, <laughs> it was a 35 millimeter film, no Pro Tools, and I ended up having to slice little tiny perfs out of all the pieces of music in order to bring it back into sync with what he'd actually performed to the more expensive piece of music. Let me set up what, what we're doing here. Norman is one difficult, two, bullheaded, three, obstreperous, but an incredibly good guest. <laughs> so he is giving me an interview that I would use regardless. But most people are not necessarily that coherent. 
And what will normally happen when you ask someone to repeat the question is, is they will say, well, when I was the music editor on Sophie's Choice, beat, and then they'll start with a real answer. And I have found that when people repeat the question, they do this throwaway line where they put the question in. When I was the music editor on Sophie's Choice, beat, and as soon as that beat is over, the answer actually starts. And that, that repeating of the question allows their brain to catch up with, with their mouth and I then end up with a much more cogent answer than if I just asked somebody a question that didn't say repeat, because now I've got something that I can cut out, and I cut into the heart of the emotion of the answer. So what I'm listening for when I'm asking the question and having them repeat is that point where I can cut into just the succinct part of the answer, not the throwaway stuff. Norman, on the other hand, by being the glib expert that he is, includes the question smoothly like any professional interview guest would do, and basically, if the host is completely useless, the guest will take over the interview and give the answers they want anyway. So the big challenge there when you're interviewing someone like Norman or someone that's on camera a lot is to make sure they don't take control of the interview away mm -hmm. from you, mm -hmm. which I would do by giving them a throwaway question every couple minutes just to have them say, what the heck was that for? And then come back in and get back to the subject again. I'm actually thinking that right now, but. Um, I do want to say that in terms of the style of interviews, there, there is in fact a whole, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, um, there are, there's certainly a style of documentary filmmaker in which the interviewer must disappear. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not editing back and forth from Q to A, Q to A, Q to A. And then that's very helpful to actually have that uh, question embedded in the answer. With with the stuff that I do on camera, I never appear. Mm -hmm. With the radio stuff, I'm always the interviewer because you hear right. a dial. In and fact, uh, Mr. Thomas and I did an interview this morning, and Michael was brilliant in terms of, of talking about... Did he repeat the question properly? <laughs> yes, I did repeat the question. Properly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's all yours, Larry. Go. Seventeen times he repeated the question. <laughs> the, uh, no, but Michael does a good job because he's on, he's on camera a lot, and, he, and Norman's on camera a lot, but most people are not. And by getting them to repeat the question, several things happen. One is they say, okay, this is where I'm going, but then they say, oh, I've got to repeat the question, and they get all stressed about repeating the question. Then they repeat the question, the stress goes away, and they just give me a natural-sounding answer. So there's, there's lots of of work that I'm doing to get them to relax and to concentrate on what they think I want, which is repeating the question, and I'm not. What I'm really after is I want them to relax and give me a solid answer. And by having them focus on the wrong thing, I get the right thing with the emotion that I need. Now, once you've got your questions, we gotta start to put it together. And Norman, the brilliant master that he is, has brought something for us to show. Your turn. Well. Thank you. Um, so one thing I want to say is, is Larry, um, the, well, let me say two things about what Larry just did. Let me, no, th no two. Um, and uh, the first one is, is that Larry says, he's the tech and I talk story. Well, that's the gimmick that we used for two real guys. All right, so how many of you have seen two real guys? Lie, raise your hand, please. All right, All right good, thank you. Okay, and you're still here tonight, which is <laughs> sort of amazing. That's, thank you. Um, uh, but in fact, virtually everything he said applies to story. And so I'm going to put it in that perspective. Um, the one uh, caveat or the one addition that I will say is that everything that Larry was talking about was in the interview process, which is different than how that shows up in the final product in the editing. Um, if it's a straight transcription of what that interview was, sure, then, then they're one-to-one, -one, they're equal. But that, as we all know, um, in most of the work that we're doing, we are combining interviews. We are using one to reinforce another. Uh, we're building story across five minutes, ten minutes, two hours, or whatever. And that's sort of what I want to talk about. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to start by asking you all a question. This will be a yes or no question, so I'm already wrong. Um, so how many of you have seen the documentary 20 Feet from Stardom? Okay, great, so this is gonna work. I was worried for a second. 
Um, so one thing that I want to talk about, Larry discussed how you should have a plan going into your interview. And I'm going to take that one step further. I think that a plan for a particular interview in a documentary that may be an accumulation of several interviews, or in the case of 20 Feet from Stardom, a whole metric crap ton of interviews, um, uh, when you're putting all together, it's, it's one piece of an overall structure. And so what is necessary beyond the plan for an interview is an idea and plan for the entire film. Now we all know that documentaries are written in the editing room, but they're certainly not funded in the editing room, and so you end up having to pitch and get funding. And uh, they're also planned previous to the editing room as well. How would you differentiate between a plan, a point of view, and a script? Well, that's a very good question. I may not answer that one yet. <laughs> No, uh, that's, that's in fact precisely what we're going to talk about. So for those of you who know what, uh, uh, who have spent any time looking at Two Real Guys or any of the things I've done on lynda.com, or in the case of poor Hillary here, who's had to sit through some of my classes at USC, uh, you know that I'm really super big on a concept called the log line. And for me, the log line is a two or at most three sentence description of what your overall idea for the film is, not plot, not plot, but um, the sense that if your audience walked out of the movie not understanding this log line, then you would have failed in your film. So it's at the core what you want the audience to walk out of the film with. I'm getting to the script. Um, so for 20 Feet from Stardom, you could say this is a story about the backup singers for some famous and top rock uh, bands of the last 50 years. Okay, you could say that, but that wouldn't be very helpful in terms of understanding what you want the audience to leave with. What kind of emotion, what kind of feeling do you want to leave with the why in your arc? So let's get a tiny bit deeper here. You could say that it's about a whole bunch of people who you don't know, who work just a mere 20 feet from the major stars, but who are incredibly talented on their own. Right? You could say that also, and that gets you a little bit further, but it still doesn't provide an overall um, arc for your feature story, doesn't even provide a through line, a rope, that you can tug your audience through. So here's one that may be slightly better, um, and I'm going to phrase it in a slightly different way. You do not know these people. You do not know the very people who are incredibly talented on their own, incredibly dynamic, individuals with their own stories who work with some of the top rock and pop singers of the last 50 years. But by the end of this movie, you're going to realize how valuable they are to the people who they were only 20 feet away from. All right, that's a little bit better. Actually, it's a lot bit better. Why? Because I thought about it ahead of time. <laughs> uh, why is it better? Because it actually provides a beginning and a middle and an end structure, it provides a goal. If for a log line as an editor, I need to know what's the ending. I, I need to know that spoiler in order to know where I'm heading so I can prep for it all along the way. What needs to be set up at the beginning of that 20 feet from starter movie in order to do what I just suggested, the fact that you don't know these people. You have no idea who they are. They were 20 feet away from these famous people. By the middle, you're going, oh, wow, they actually are very talented. And by the end, you're going to be going, they have their own unique talents that I will never forget now. And that's actually, this, this movie's amazing. For those of you who haven't seen it, your homework assignment is to watch it in the next 10 minutes. No, your homework, just, just go and watch it. It's really amazing. Uh, so if you have some sense of the overall, if you know what has to happen at the beginning and the middle and the end of your story, now you can begin to uh, plan 
what each of the interviews are, what you have to cover in all of the interviews. It doesn't mean that you know, hey, this interview is going to be at the beginning, and so I need to have the setup. It's you're beginning to then ask the, inter uh, the, uh, the questions that you talk about prepping for, because each time you go and do an interview and get your transcripts and figure out what's going on, you can begin to build a more and more solid script. That you can say these things. Uh, I think you had um, uh, Kevin Lipnos here, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, the editors of Tony Few from Stardom, and Doug Blush. Doug Blush. Yeah, Doug was here. Um, and uh, Kevin told me that um, he had worked on, uh, I think it was the, um, oh, Pearl there was Jam. the Pearl Jam, right? He did Pearl Jam 20. And uh, he was on that movie a year before he started editing. He watched everything and came up with plans and ideas with corkboard and all that. So he was planning the arc knowing what he wanted to say. So, so does it start Stuart? with a point of view? And that point of view evolves into the log line. Mm -hmm. The log line evolves for a plan. And then from that master plan for the show, you do the plan for the interviews. And then once the interviews are done, you sculpt a story out of it. Yes. I, I would add one thing to that, which is, Quite often on a feature documentary, you're doing many journeys out to interview. So you'll interview a bunch, come back, edit, then, oh, I should interview a couple more people who will do this, this, and that. So it's not a single continuum. There's a lot going on. It's an amazing movie. And one of the things that just, so let's talk a little bit about the style here. This is a movie that fiercely guards its idea that the interviewer will not be on camera, will not be part of the story. The people who tell the story, both on camera and off camera, are its participants. And that is a style which informs the story which is then being told. So by the time they got halfway through the interviews, they knew the story that they were telling, something closer to the third version that I told you than the first one. Um, they also knew who was going to be telling the story. They knew some of the featured people, but they knew that it's our characters. This is how you're gonna get to know them. This is how you're gonna get to respect them. So by the time we get to the end, you will feel what my log line wanted you to feel. By the way, I'll be surprised if they actually use that sentence, but that um, they knew what they wanted. So the particular style that they approached here to have, uh, uh, was, was then drastically reinforced in the editorial process. A lot of the shots of her listening were stolen from all kinds of places in the interview, not, not literally the exact place where she was listening to those things. Um, and why? Because they knew that they wanted you to get to know her as best as possible. So that comes from story, and then the individual interview itself came from that script, from that plan that you were talking about. So let's take a look at a second piece. Uh, and this is from a documentary that's actually done by uh, one of our students at USC, uh, a grad student in the uh, second year program in the documentary side, called No Kill. Uh, and this is about, uh, it's about pet shelters and compares the pet shelters in LA who will kill the animals if they're not adopted within a certain number of days versus one in Las Vegas that has a no-kill policy no matter how long they're there. Uh, it was a tremendous piece of advocacy documentary. And the woman who made this actually uh, figured out a certain style that she wanted. Uh, and it also had to do with, if I can say this, humanizing the animals. Uh, or dogizing the dogs, I don't know. Um, so what I want to, to show is the very beginning, because in the very beginning, these are 20-minute um, documentaries. So long for some things, but short in terms of establishing feel, style, story, and engagement with the audience. Um, so this is the beginning, and it'd be interesting to sort of see how she sucked you in. So let's take a look.
Different location, but now I moved, so I, mean, I can't really have her there. Because there's uh, other people living there as well. So, okay, I think we can stop here. I've been told I have the five-minute warning on this. No, you want to see the rest of this, trust me. But just the fact that you don't means that you've been engaged, right? And the way in which this is shaped by opening in black, you hear the dogs, and as soon as the light comes on, they stop. Who gets the, the title? The dog. What personalities are given? The dog. The dog answers. So by the time we get one minute in, if you don't go, oh my God, look at how they're living. Oh my God, look, there's a sign that says we're going to like kill them, right? Um, you're on the dog side. There's nothing unconscious about this. Um, the, the task of editing, I often say, is to consciously be aware of things that the audience will be unconscious of. And the music helps shape that, the cinematography and the editing all shape it together so that by the time we're one minute in, this is something painful to watch. All right, so the good news is, I won't make you watch it all.